welcome everyone to the 2023 member showcase of the Association of Consultants for Liturgical Spaces, Breathing New Life. We hope this is a fun evening for everyone and make sure to write down your questions so that you can ask them at the end. Our first presenter could not be here tonight. She is in Ireland. Margaret Adams Parker is speaking about creating beauty and meaning for sacred spaces. Thank you, Pam. I'm delighted to be able to talk about a revitalization project for Iglesia Santa Maria, an Episcopal church in Falls Church in the Northern Virginia suburbs. The church houses a Spanish language congregation, most of whom are from Bolivia. Iglesia Santa Maria is a sister parish with St. Mary's Episcopal Church, a primarily Anglo congregation in neighboring Arlington, Virginia, and the two congregations share outreach ministries and periodic joint services. The project transformed a derelict wooded hillside into a sacred space open to all comers, creating an outdoor meditation trail and revitalizing a worn outdoor altar into an open air sanctuary, including a grotto with a sculpture of Our Lady of Guadalupe. The changes have created a place important to Santa Maria, to the church's immediate neighbors and to the larger Spanish speaking community. In addition, the property formerly taxed by the county as buildable, buildable land is now considered part of the sanctuary and therefore tax exempt. In the first phase of the reclamation, members of both congregations, including youth, carved a meditation trail into the hillside and set up stations of the cross along the trail. The path guides worshipers from the church parking lot up through a wooded hillside to three crosses perched on a rocky summit overlooking a busy thoroughfare. Stark black and white images are mounted along the trail, graphic reminders of the way of the cross. The stations are light, fast, and weatherproof images printed on dye bond aluminum panels. The images are reproductions of my own original woodcut prints framed here within black borders with the titles printed in Spanish and English. Two introductory panels at the foot of the trail describe the station's tradition and the long relationship between the two congregations. Each year, the two congregations observe Good Friday together with a bilingual service of prayer and chant. In most years, 40 to 60 participants join in person, often with 2,000 or more worshiping online. For the second phase of the project, the churches clad the existing brick altar with stone, paved the altar area, and boarded it with a low retaining wall out of matching stone. Then he built steps leading to the altar and constructed a stone grotto directly behind the altar. I was commissioned to help design this grotto and create a sculpture of Our Lady of Guadalupe to be placed there. Here you can see my initial sketches in pencil and clay. Budget constraints would not allow a bronze sculpture, but because the sculpture would be placed under the shelter of the grotto, and since the weather in the winter in Northern Virginia is rarely severe, I was able to build a Guadalupe using aqua resin over an armature. Aqua resin uses fiberglass with a hardening liquid that results in a thin but extremely tough shell. This allowed me to finish the sculpture with oil paint glazes, simulating the Guadalupe's distinctive green cloak. I wanted to be faithful to the original image, 
Juan Diego's tilma that now hangs in the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. Since the Guadalupe has become the unofficial patroness of all those in our own country with Spanish speaking ancestry. But I also wanted to honor the ancestry of this particular congregation by giving the Virgin indigenous features. And in this, I look to the magnificent sculpture of Francisco Zuniga, here a drawing after one of his sculptures and a clay study for the head. This change has proved to be particularly meaningful to the congregation and many have also come in on the power of an image which shows the Virgin as a grown woman who bears on her face the traces of her suffering. Here are photos of the insulation under a tent on a rainy day. And the festive and sunlight sunlit service of dedication. Here you can see the relation of the various parts just beyond the parking lot at the bottom. We see the introductory panels above that the altar area with the grotto and to the left, the beginning of the station's trail. One particularly moving aspect of this setting is that twice a month in this parking lot, 200 to 300 families drive through to receive food assistance from volunteers drawn from both congregations. And you can just glimpse uh, in both photos the beginning of the station's trail. The images of Christ's suffering are particularly apt at these times. And Our Lady of Guadalupe seems to preside over the least of these, our brothers and sisters. And each time I visit, I see that she is rarely without flowers at her feet and rosaries draped over her hands. Beautiful project, Peggy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Sister Marilyn Morgan, who will be speaking about our Mother of Confidence Church in San Diego, California. Hello, I'm Marilyn Morgan. I'm from San Francisco. Um, this parish, our Mother of Confidence, is in University City in San Diego. And um, originally, this church was um, on the bottom floor, and it was what is now the hall. And um, it's built on a slight hill. So this is the church that was built on top of the hall. And there is one entryway into the front of the church. And um, the entryway proved to be very steep for people who couldn't maneuver it. So they used to cart people to the front door of the church in a golf cart. So one of the first major things that they decided was that they needed to do an entryway um, Pam, you can do the next one, uh, an entryway that it was accessible for people. And then they built an elevator on the side for people who could not maneuver the steps. And the entryway um, provided a, um, more than just the old vestibule. So this is the uh, interior of the old church. And as you can see, it was a, a 70s church. It's all orange and uh, it wasted a lot of space and uh, it's far away, the altar is far away from the seating area. Next. Um, the main focal point of this church was this uh, sculpture of bronze, well, not bronze, it's many me uh, metals of the Shroud of Turin and the altar was shaped like a coffin. Uh, the walls are cinder block and um, it was very dark. Uh, and as you can see, the, um, the baptismal font is in the entryway. Next, uh, the shroud, uh, people want, some people wanted to save it, some people did not. Um, the pastor definitely wanted it out of the church. So what they did was to mount it outside the church in the entryway to the hall. 
and people were very happy with that. Um, and it can withstand the weather, uh, which is usually very good. So they saved it and they can honor it. Next, this is the door into the church. Um, there was no separation between the vestibule, which was not a gathering space, it was basically a vestibule into the church. And um, so they have glass walls so that you can see into it. And they created a narthex that um, you can gather into. And for them, they have a very big um, Christmas crush and they can put it in the narthex and there's still room to gather around it. Next, this is the baptismal font. And because the building, the, the existing church is built over the original church, they had to shore up the flooring to be able to support the water and um, the stone of this baptismal font. And there are, as you can see, stairs going into the font. And once inside, you can have stairs that will walk onto the other side so that you come out facing the altar. Uh, and that symbolism was very important to the people. Uh, the corpus is made of bronze. Um, one thing that was sort of amusing is the people were not um, ready for the, the patina that they got in this, but they're very happy with it. And uh, it's put in front of a negative space. Um, they wanted it positioned to the side of the altar so that people could have access to it if they wanted to. If they wanted to come up and touch it, it would be just be a step up to it. So um, it's really quite beautiful. Next, this is the ceiling. The ceiling of the original church was really high and they lowered it about 20 feet to um, enhance everything within the church. And it, it's in a fan shape. It has um, created a, a very beautiful, warm atmosphere within the church. This is the new sanctuary. Uh, this picture was taken before they put the corpus up there. Um, there is a ramp behind that you can access the altar area. Um, this is all new furniture. And you can see behind it, there's a box that's actually the tabernacle. And I will show you a, a picture of it later on, but that's where it's located. And they also changed the seating area that I'll show you this more later, but it's curved pews around the, um, the altar area. Next, this is um, the holy oils and they are sit, they sit above um, a gift table. It's a built-in shelf where they can put the things, uh, the book and the gifts for the altar. And um, you see that the stand for the Paschal candle, that's a temporary stand when it's not um, and it's other stand for um, Easter time. Next, this is the camp stand. And um, it's a, we wanted it to be different from the ambo. And uh, it sits at the, uh, the place for music, which sits in the same place as the music was originally, but we've added um, tiers for the, um, for the choir to sit in and the space for the piano. And this is the new uh, music space, uh, which as I said, seat, seats to the right. Um, the pews, um, they wanted it to have um, good accessibility so that you can get in and out of the pews. If you look to the back, you can see the front doors of the, uh, the church, the entryway into the, from the narthex. And you can see vaguely the font there so that you can get a position of um, what you're looking at. Next, we um, have accessible seating throughout the church. Uh, we didn't want it just in the front or just in the back, but they wanted to be able to have something that was simple. People could just lift up the pew and, um, and have their wheelchair there and sit with their families. That was important to them. Next, this is again another picture of the, uh, the music area. And... Uh, can you go back one pan, please? Um, you can see the mics that are hanging down. 
And we also um, provided for good lighting for the music area, which is often an area that does not get good lighting. So they were quite happy with that. Time's up. Our next presenter is Paul Barabo, who will be speaking about St. Luke Lutheran Church in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Paul? So uh, this is a project, um, an existing church that was built in 1966. The congregation is older. And our, our renovation uh, was completed in the 50th year after that church was built. The style of the church, as many churches in this era in the Midwest, was built with what uh, we sometimes call the new cathedral style. So the shape and volume of a cathedral, but much more austere um, uh, ornament and uh, obviously a lot less detail or at least uh, ostentatious detail. In this particular church, you can see one of the problems that is often encountered with the approach to this style. A lot of light in the front and incredibly poor lighting in the nave. Uh, I called this the cinema because it really approximated a cinema with a bright screen or a bright uh, area of action in the front and uh, a darkened area of seating. They did have, uh, I think, very beautiful um, art glass from the time in their ambulatory, and also uh, a fairly significant piece of artwork in the front, which had to do, if I understand correctly, with the boats of uh, the immigrants and um, the statues of the 12 apostles in miniature. It's easy to see from this photo what happens with extreme light. Uh, the window to the right faces east. And over time, the wooden carving from the church of the apostles bleached. And they looked, uh, the church described them as being ghoulish. The platform also was all marble and the altar was all marble. Nothing was flexible and very little room at the top of the seven steps of ascent up to the top of the platform. You can see the lighting has very little output in the fixtures, nicely embedded uh, chunks of stained glass that you can barely experience, but uh, no output that was significant to light the worship space. Next. The renovation, the key point that we worked for was to accentuate the arts in the space and primarily to bring in new light into the nave and to temper the light at the front of the church so that the pastors wouldn't bake and to provide a larger platform with flexible altar ambo and to create enough room that their choir could uh, perform parts of the liturgy or special uh, choral events from the front of the sanctuary. You'll notice the front backdrop to the altar is uh, devoid of the apostles. Those were removed and relocated and we commissioned new art glass to be the backdrop for the font that was or for the existing cross, which was brought out from the back wall and positioned over the center of the altar platform. Next. This is a picture of the old uh, platform. You can see uh, the bulk of the platform is circulation for communion at table. And then it's really hard to see because it's all uh, black marble, the steps up to the altar and a massive altar, uh, um, incredibly large. They realized that there was very little in the way of artwork that could engage the congregation beyond the art glass along the side. So at some point they had fabric, uh, colorful art created that never 
was replaced and not necessarily uh, consistent with other symbols in the space and then not uh, able to change liturgically. Next. The new platform provided accessibility and complete flexibility. So all of the risers and chairs could be removed. The ambo and the altar could move as well. The communion rail was removable and uh, much more uh, ability to program not only liturgy, the church being a Lutheran church, is able to provide uh, music, uh, secular music uh, ensembles in the space and the flexibility of the platform assisted them with their sacred music, their contemporary services, and also uh, touring choirs that would come and visit the church. Acoustically, the space was actually very good. We did have to perforate the wood in the surround of the chancel the altar platform to be able to balance the right acoustic for music groups. And it's a little harder to see, but the shelves that are about uh, two thirds up the way of the uh, wood wainscot actually enable uh, screen and screen technology to be used as a part of the worship discreetly. Next. And just uh, flexibility and the size of the chancel. You can see the front rows of seating were uh, able to be uh, movable. One minute, Paul. Sure. And uh, a part of tempering the light was to put in to those large windows, perforated shade out of that beam that runs across the uh, triangular portion of the window. And then to temper the light further above uh, that uh, housing of the spade, we uh, provided um, abstract glass that would echo the pattern of the new stained glass. Next. The light that we brought into the worship space, can you go back one, Pam? The light that we brought into the worship space, we had to temper and also used uh, textured glass in order to shield some of the direct light that would hit the front of the chancel. Time's next. up. Okay, uh, next up is Paul May, who is speaking about Unity Church, a Unitarian church in St. Paul. Good evening. Yes, I'm Paul May from Twin Cities. And this is a project about entry and meaning. Um, cloisters have a, have a long history in church architecture. And what you see here is the result, but it wasn't always that way. So next slide, please. Cloisters um, are, are abound and they usually provide respite and they usually create intimacy. And they also provide separation. This church in St. Paul has a cloister in the in the front, uh, the cloister was created. Um, the original building was uh, church was about 1925. The cloister was added in the 1960s. This area of St. Paul was very active, um, a significant amount of riots, race riots during the 60s. And the church chose to create a cloister around um, a portion of, of the church. Um, but this cloister became the really the focus point of the transformation of the church as they sought to have a building that better represented their theological approach and their uh, desire to outreach to the neighborhood. Next slide. The, the church had wooden doors that that uh, this was the entry door that made it very mm, uh, uh, uninviting, I guess would be the polite word for this. And the, the congregation was really uh, concerned about, again, opening up 
and inviting the neighborhood in and their existing architecture did not do that. Next slide. Other doors similar to it. What resulted was taking off the cloister. You can, next slide, that would work fine. The result was taking off the cloister and exposing the corner to the neighborhood. But again, we had a very orthogonal church and one of the elements that was added was these curved glass entry, which again, uh, reflected the progressive theology that the Unitarian Church had, as well as, as created a difference to the orthogonal nature that the church had always been. The entry glows at night, the entry is fully accessible, whereas before there were uh, four to six steps to go into each, um, each of the entry doors previously. Next slide. Early sketches from, that we developed had various variations of how we, would, how we would anchor the corner, how we would approach the entrance. And we went through a series of, of these before we ended up with the, the result that you saw. Next slide. The plan was one in the lower right-hand corner that created a garden space. And the garden space introduced circular elements. It introduced um, uh, water features. There's a water weir in there. It brought a ramp to um, modify or to um, correspond to the change of elevation between the street corner and the and the entry. It also, as we found out, becomes a little sledding hill for the for the kids in the neighborhood as well. Because as you might imagine, there's snow for 11 and a half months in St. Paul. Um, well, or maybe not, maybe only four and a half months. Next slide. Again, a focus on, on the entry garden, which includes new vegetation, which softens the streetscape, softens the, the original stone architecture, and yet builds upon um, the, the legacy of the, of the church going back over uh, into the 1920s and over a hundred years now, as well as adding new elements of glass and light and, uh, and movement. Next slide. Early sketches of what it might look like um, to show uh, the congregation. Next slide. And the final, the final few slides show, in addition to the glass and the copper, copper roof, there is a sunshade device made of um, wood which extends into the building. Next slide. And glows at night. Next slide. So that you see in the entry area, the original church is uh, on the right, a new entry into their fellowship hall and their kitchen and materials again that let you um, have a very earthy, um, earthy experience as well as looking out into the entry courtyard. Next slide. And the fellowship hall, next slide. This again is the entry with the curved and the sunshade device on the outside, the pergola, which extends into the inside. This again leads you around the, um, the bell tower and into the main entry of the church. Next slide. Looking back from the entry into the courtyard. Next slide. And we, we end with the water weir with the, with the words we remember. In the course of of removing the cloister and creating the courtyard, we discovered cremains in the courtyard and they were gathered, they were placed and, and, and the water weir was added as a place of remembrance for the, uh, for the cremains that were there and actually continues now as various uh, landscape areas within the courtyard have become a place for scattering ashes of members of the congregation. That is it. Thank you. Next is Maddie Grunke from St. Uh, she's from uh, Conrad Schmidt. She'll be talking about St. Bernadette Church in Scottsdale, Arizona. Maddie? Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Maddie. I'm from Conrad Schmidt Studios. We're located just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 
Next slide. Due to the exponential growth of the Phoenix Diocese, a new church in Scottsdale, Arizona broke ground in 2016. The parish dedicated all of the available funds um, to the project with the goal of designing and building an elegant church that would stand the test of time. Next slide. Upon completion of the structure, funding was unavailable for full decoration of the interior. The Romanesque style church was left bare with just the plain walls for five years. Next slide. The interior decoration was completed following an ambitious fundraising campaign and many months of planning. Stencils, um, symbolic stencils, beautiful murals, and new stained glass was all done to enhance the space and represent the great kingdom of God. The final result was an interpretation of truth, goodness, and beauty. Next slide. The goal of this 2021 project was to provide a worship space that speaks to God's glory and inspires a person to a sense of hol holiness from the moment that they would walk in. During the project's conceptual design phase, a digital rendering was created to show the client exactly what the church would look like. Next slide. The designs created for St. Bernadette included a great deal of symbolism. Flowering vines are an earthly representation of the garden of heaven, perfection, and paradise. Repeating patterns feature an interwoven and symbolized crosses, suggesting eternity and infinity. Simple schoolwork is Romanesque style, in the Romanesque style, is keeping with the architectural style that was already represented in the church. Next slide. In addition to the extensive amount of stencils that were used and symbolism within the church, there are nine large murals on the ceiling. These murals are a visual representation um, of the events um, from the life of Christ, particularly with um, emphasis on Mary and her earthly life. A large mural in the church's apse features American saints with the Immaculate Conception of Mary at the center and underneath the baldacchino on the ceiling features a very large mural depicting the Holy Spirit. Next slide. CSS designed and fabricated 34 new stained glass windows. They were commissioned to enhance the traditional Romanesque architecture of the space. Each window was specifically designed for the space, featuring an image of, they were, there are many, but either a particular saint, the archan an archangel, or representations of our Blessed Mother. Each image in the stained glass windows had rich, was very rich with symbolism and meaning and color, and Father was very powerful and wanting very rich colors in his stained glass. Next slide. The artists and craftsmen worked overtime and the project was completed in a mere five months. So this is an ongoing photo of the project with scaffolding up. Next slide. CSS had 50 employees working on site for more than 18,000 hours, bringing this vision to life. So this is a photo of our foreman working on layout. Next slide. This is three steps um, showing the stages of the mural progress. So the first one is the underpainting. Then the artist went back and added in the background and then added in the colors to the figures. Next slide. And this is a photo from our shop in, it's in New Berlin. So just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as we started to put together and cut out the rose windows. Next slide. With stained glass murals, intricate stencils and gilded details, Father Don Klein and the St. Bernadette Renovation Committee wanted to do more than just make the church pretty. The renowned interior strives to draw your mind and hearts to God and inspire the marvelous sense of community that is so important to the Catholic faith. So this is a photo of an after shot. Next slide. Another after shot. Next slide. And this is looking up at that apps mural. Next slide. And then another photo looking up at the murals across the ceiling. Thank you all for having me.
Thank you, Maddie. Our next presenter is Greg Davis, who's speaking about St. Peter Catholic Church in Bernie, Texas. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Gregory Davis in San Antonio. Uh, wanted to start here with a little bit of uh, perspective on the uh, site plan uh, of this property. Uh, originally, it had 17 different uh, structures on this uh, piece of property. And we were asked to uh, take an old original church uh, to, uh, from 1923 from 200 seats to 850 seats. Uh, in doing that, it created some uh, uh, issues with the city and we ended up having to demolish an existing building. Uh, off to the right uh, of the original church was the, the actual original church that was on the site from uh, 1863. Uh, which uh, has a, a lot of history in, in this particular city. Uh, next slide. Uh, as you can see, as uh, time passed, we, we looked at the site plan and the, uh, at the eight area, that was the original church uh, that we talked about on the site. Uh, four was the 1863 church. And the new addition was a new 800 seat sanctuary uh, connected to the uh, existing uh, church that we were renovating. The, the issues that came up uh, took several years to, to uh, I guess, uh, get through the, the, the uh, attorneys uh, that the city of Bernie did not want this building built. They did not want the uh, original uh, church touched. And it took three years to get through the courts and the Supreme Court uh, in Washington, DC. As we went through that, uh, there were many, many uh, meetings with the city and with the uh, parish at the time. And uh, it uh, went through and finally was able to uh, begin construction. Uh, you can see the, the various pieces that ended up staying and off to the left uh, at the uh, uh, middle of the uh, page uh, below number two was a, uh, a gathering space for uh, the Easter fire, which was added to the project. Next slide. You can see what we did to the original plan uh, before the project, uh, we ended up uh, eliminating the apse end of the church and use the uh, existing uh, space to create a daily mass chapel, a uh, reconciliation room and a Eucharistic chapel uh, to attach to the new sanctuary uh, that we added. The uh, the space, again, was uh, one that was built in the 1800s and had, or in the early 2023, uh, and had nothing but uh, uh, rubble walls. And so a lot of uh, reforming those walls had to take place and redoing the existing stained glass that was uh, located in those walls. Next slide. And you can uh, again see the where the uh, uh, space attached to this, and the the lighting that came in through the stained glass wall uh, of each of these uh, uh, areas uh, basically lit up this uh, this space, the renovation space, and then the new space we added uh, 850 seats in an antiphonal, antiphonal uh, floor plan arrangement uh, with a baptism font at the uh, entryway and a uh, gathering area in the middle and then the altar at number four with the choir at number five. Uh, next slide. This is a view of the new renovated space 
you can see the uh, older stained glass that was left in place on both sides and uh, the we lowered the ceiling height in in this area uh, and took the uh, stonework into the interior okay next slide next slide this is a cross section of the new sanctuary uh, with the altar uh, looking at the altar end with the uh, open trusses on top uh, and new stained glass to the right and open glass looking out to the hill country to the left. Next slide. The original concept uh, that was originally uh, put forward was uh, a fan-shaped seating arrangement which had open trusses and a uh, altar at the at the end of that uh, hallway or that main aisle and open glass on either side and and stained glass on the right side you can see on the in the new design uh, we ended up with a baptismal font with a, a clearing in the middle and antiphonal seating on the left and the right hand side with the uh uh, corpus uh, at, at the at the far end of the uh, narthex of the church. Uh, next slide. You have a minute, Greg. One minute. Okay. Uh, in the uh, in this slide on the left is uh, looking down through the uh, clearing at the baptismal font, the uh, ambo, and then the altar area with the corpus at the at the end of that space. Again, you can see the uh, stained glass windows to the right and the open uh, windows to the left to the hill country. The stained glass windows on the right hand side were from a church in Philadelphia that was being torn down that had a relationship uh, with this church being a, uh, a German uh, church built in, in Bernie, Texas. On the right hand side is a tabernacle uh, that was designed by Claire Wing and a stone from one of the uh, 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 ranches that uh, was right outside of Bernie. Next slide. Uh, that's the end of seven. And, and the rest is there. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Our Next presenter is Scott Parsons, who is speaking about Holy Trinity Church in Columbus, Ohio. Scott? Yeah, yeah thank you, Pam. Um, and I'm speaking to you from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, here's a view of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Columbus from the outside. The, um, it's, it's a, it was a, this is a project about adding a major addition to a very old church in Columbus. And uh, the new sanctuary is on the left, the old is on the right. We can go to the next slide. Oh, well, so this is sort of a before and after idea with this, this uh, talk. And so I'm just gonna show you sort of my part of this. This was the before in the new sanctuary. And then if you can switch there, yeah, now that's the after. So what was really kind of unique and exciting about the, the layout in the sanctuary for this congregation is that they, uh, with the liturgical calendar would uh, change the seating uh, in the worship space, uh, the orientation. So sometimes they face this wall, sometimes they face the organ, sometimes they face the apse, but there was four different directions for the congregation throughout the year. Uh, but for a good 10 years, when they were facing this direction, they looked at a, a blank wall uh, behind the altar. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of walk you through the thought process of, of how I did the design, how the design was made. But what you're looking at is glass, mosaic, wood, uh, and stainless steel, and primarily highlighting what would be sacramental to the Lutheran tradition of communion and baptism. And uh, there's also kind of, a, with, the, with the reds and the blues, which I'll talk about, there's also a um, kind of a triptych to this. And, and maybe if you switch slides, I can show you how that. that. So this is sort of the, the sort of sculptural sense of, of what I was after. Uh, where you have sort of uh, the sort of a Trinitarian foundation with what's depicted here is red and gray, these sort of vertical reaches uh, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
And then I wanted to create a, a framing for this, but not an enclosed frame. And um, and so the church, so we we talked about this in the so the framing is sort of towards the top, but open to below. So these vertical um, movements would, would come down to, in a sense to the earth to, to touch the ground. We can probably go to another slide. And so the church was looking for something that would be highly uh, responsive to the to the liturgical calendar, to the to the lectionary cycle. Um, to an individual's faith that they didn't want just a single scene sort of depicted that would um, sort of uh, sort of fix fix itself, but that that each each week each time uh, a congregant would come in, uh, their relationship to the liturgy and reflections on their faith would be in, in response to this work. So I worked in more of an abstract sense. Um, here you can see the the real idea of sort of fire and water with the baptism and the communion extending from above to below, the blue through the red. And the associations, right, of, of, of rivers and uh, and the, the healing waters, the baptismal waters, um, even in Revelation in the New Jerusalem. But one of the things I wanted to sort of abstractly suggest was with the left and right panels, a sort of a U shape going through the waters at the bottom, uh, like like an open receptacle, like uh, hands, sort of uh, maybe in prayer. Okay, we go to the next one. And so this this uh, piece is just composed of. of thousands of pieces of glass and uh, one begins sort of sorting these out uh, in sort of color palettes. I, I worked with a fantastic studio in Montreal called Mosaica, it's spelled with a K, and we'll see some shots of their studio here as we go forward. So next one, please. And so the tools, if, if you're not familiar with Mosaic, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's you, you sort of snip away or you can, there, there's also other ways of where you sort of pound on, on a on a, on a sort of an axe blade that's wedged into a log, but the, primarily, primarily it's the snippers that they use uh, in Montreal at Mosaica. And uh, yeah, we can see, you can see a lot of swirliness in the glass. And so everything gets sort of gridded out section by section, piece by piece. And then you start marking off uh, where you go with, with the design. We can go to another slide. And here's a couple of those panels, uh, sort of gives you a little bit of a sense of the, of the scale of the piece. And we can go to the next one. And there's kind of a ta-da moment with one of the panels. And there you get just kind of a shot of the studio as well. And uh, this was just fun to be there and visiting and, and uh, just purely happenstance, but it's fun to see uh, work by uh, Chuck uh, uh, Close and Yoko Ono in the same list. Yeah, it's just, uh, I don't know, <laughs> humbling. <laughs> okay, next one. And here's some, uh, some of the craftspeople, some of the artists that work at Mosaica working on various projects. And, uh, and then uh, the cross was also part of this Reredos design. And um, you'll see in a moment why I chose to work with stainless steel, but this is Juno Works in Denver. And, uh, they, and here you can kind of see the wells. Ultimately, this becomes kind of a seamless brushed uh, stainless uh, look to the cross. There's an inset. Yeah, go ahead. To the next one. You might see there's kind of an incised line uh, that runs down from maybe the more or less the center of the cross to when, when Christ was stabbed by the soldier. That was sort of the suggestion of that. Um, in the Lutheran tradition, it's, it's an empty cross that speaks to resurrection. Um, I, I tried to infuse a lot of energy and movement into the mosaic, into the patterns. A lot of the work on the left and right um, are sort of fractal based. So, so they sort of have a, a evoke a sorts of a sense of infinity. Um, I thought also of ascension, um, and and again lots of layering. So when this gets lit, there's it's not just a flat piece on the wall, but there's layer upon layer and different kinds of shadowing and, and depth to the to the piece. Okay, and uh, just to give you a couple of details. So uh, again, the the great work that Mosaica was doing here. You know, every piece has to be fitted. Uh, okay, yeah, I think we're about there. I think I have another detail or, or two to show you if you want to switch to another one. Yeah, just give you another another section. So there's some, some uh, curvilinear lines that kind of run through the patterns that you see and some larger shapes and a lot of sort of interwoven and layering sense of, uh, of movement and color. Um, um, and hopefully the, the connection between spirit and life and God's, God's uh, activity and creative and divine activity in, in humanity. Okay. And... Next one. And there you can see the relationship of the stainless material in the cross to the uh, organ on the uh, right of the church there. 
and you can get a little more sense of the, the relief you know, and there's kind of a final piece of you looking straight on again. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this and to present this project to you all. Thank you very much, Scott. Okay, our last presenter is Gilbert Sangera, who is speaking about St. Joseph the Worker in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just start by saying this is an example of a low budget project. And so uh, in 2009, I was approached by Patty Hughes, the director of liturgy at Grand Rapids, uh, at just uh, on the western side of Michigan. Um, and uh, a large Hispanic multicultural parish. So these were Mexican, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans uh, that all had a different uh, worship style and different pieties. Uh, we're currently um, worshiping in an old historic German mission church that sat only 100 people. They needed something that could accommodate more in the area of 400. So um, they asked me to come in and to look at uh, different alternatives. Next slide. Uh, we began uh, studying alternative modular building con concepts that we could use with the congregation, but the bishop one day was driving and noticed an old Dutch Reformed church for sale and recommended that the, that the diocese buy it for this congregation. Uh, next slide. The interior of this newly acquired space was lacking anything celebratory of the Hispanic culture. With a focus on the word, uh, they tended to focus on the pulpit, which in this case was rather undersized in the sanctuary space uh, with some choir risers that were behind it. The focus was the back wall with an undersized color glass window. The space was empty of all symbols, color, and warmth that would have been familiar with the recent immigrants. And so the space also was rather tall, which presented the challenge of trying to make an overall sanctuary composition work together. Next slide. We started by doing, um, again, a, a workshopping process to surface goals and aspirations. They self-identified as a gateway parish, meaning that recent immigrants arrive, stabilize, and then move on to someplace else. And they recognized that this was a major function for them. Uh, so they needed to be a place that was uh, welcoming in the sense of familiar for uh, these folks from a multicultural Hispanic, Spanish-speaking background. Uh, and then, again, help stabilize them and help them move on. Um, they recognized that they had to work together also. In the old church, there were a number of small side altars. Each one was dedicated to a different image of Mary which each particular community brought with them and carried by hand from their native countries. These were not beautifully produced uh, statues of Mary, but they were extremely meaningful. So in the new space, uh, there was no room for side altars. So the devotional space needed to be reimagined. They also needed to support the growing permanent uh, community that was growing older. Uh, the other element of this community was that 20% of all baptisms occurred in this church, so they needed a large and very visible font. Next image. So we started by removing the old sanctuary platform and uh, created a new sanctuary platform that stretched beyond the proscenium arch that you see in the image, and then created a wooden baldacchino um, on the ceiling that uh, reflected the extension of that sanctuary into the worship space, into the nave, and then suspended the crucifix from that uh, wooden baldacchino just to draw attention away from the back wall to this kind of new location above the altar. We added a new color palette. The interior uh, department of the architectural firm, which is Progressive Architects in, in uh, uh, Grand Rapids, created a scheme, uh, and this is not the most flattering way to describe it, but I would call it a cheap Mexican restaurant. So fortunately, we had a Jesuit scholastic living in my community who was staying with us, who had actually been trained as a graphic designer in Mexico City. He asked if he could take a stab at it and came up with a glorious color palette of salmon with gold trim for the proscenium arch, olive green for the remainder of the proscenium wall, dark blue in the recesses of the back sanctuary wall, and then a warm beige that surrounded the congregation in the nave. 
The committee also prioritized an ecological approach for material selection. So even on a limited budget, we used natural linoleum uh, under the pews and then ceramic tiles in large patterns at the main aisles that extended along the sides of the sanctuary and then inserted randomly in the floor small brass squares that collected as one approached the altar platform to highlight a sense of the sacred. And then a stylized reredos was added to the back wall with the small statues of Mary that were brought by each of the immigrant groups. Next slide. We removed the old sanctuary riser in the platform and created a slightly skewed oblong or oval shaped altar platform that again extended beyond the line of the proscenium arch and then that provided a flexible choir area behind the celebrants. They had six different choirs of different sizes and uh, different stylistic approaches, uh, but that allowed them space for their various equipments. The oval gesture uh, also helped bend the, the um, attention towards the Blessed Sacrament Chapel that was in a side, almost closet-like space to the right of the sanctuary, and then to the left was a large um, uh, uh, baptismal font to be used for adults and for children. Next slide. We have a minute. Okay, next slide. You can see the color, how the color begins to enhance the space, and then the patterning in the floor with the insertion of these small brass uh, symbols to again uh, accentuate the, uh, um, the sacred. We also had a... Um, an internationally acclaimed ceramic artist who was baptized in the church and willing to do some work that created uh, beautiful ceramics on the altar inserts, the ambo insert and the crucifix. Next slide. And then uh, we created the Rarados in the back with these uh, images that were ca carried from the homelands of these different immigrant groups. Uh, the major part is that low wall that's behind the chairs of the presiders, which serves as a platform for placing both devotional candles and flowers. And this way, the people came, brought them close to the images that they were familiar with, but then saw the collection of other Marian images from the other groups that were part of that immigrant population. Next slide. Okay, we're just going to go through these because. Yep, up, and yeah. then this is one final slide. All right, good. Um, I think we maybe have a... Okay, Gail wants to know, is asking Marilyn who made the corpus in your church there? Unmute yourself. Uh, he uh, was Bruce Wolf who just died. He's from... Um, Oakland, California. And who makes the accessible pews? Um, that's one of our ACLS members who made them. And whose name escapes me, he's from San Diego. I, um, in one of your pictures on the end that we had to go through, you had also showed an accessible AMBO. And can you tell us who did that? That was Condi and Wynn. Um, that was the first accessible AMBO he'd ever made. And um, it flips over, um, you know, it just, it's, it flips over uh, to go down for the um for handicap accessibility and it's not really heavy so um it was an interesting way to address the issue okay um people have more questions you can type them in the chat or you can just turn on your mic and ask so anybody can ask any of our presenters what they'd like to ask I can say, I talked to Peggy after she gave her presentation, um, and that church that she spoke about is actually her church, and so that's pretty interesting, and I was interested that Episcopalians would want to have an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, but she says that it doesn't matter, you know, what specific religion you are, as long as you're Hispanic, you're interested in Our Lady of Guadalupe. 
So that's how that works. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Scott, your, your uh, stained glass was just incredible, the way that it looked like a painting. And I one mm -hmm. thing I was curious about was, how are those pieces of glass held together? What do it's, they put in there? Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like a cement, you know, it's mortared on the backside. Ah. Yeah. And it's also painted white so that um, you get a lot of reflected light coming through. Yeah, yeah, just incredible. Thank you very much. So it sounds like it was really a collaboration between your design and them using the particular pieces of glass that they used. Correct, yes, yeah. Yeah, um, I heard it well described once when, when, you, when an artist works with like a studio like that, that you, you, someone in a sense conducting the symphony. <laughs> mm -hmm. And all the musicians did their play, played their beautiful parts. <laughs> right, right. Well, Maddie certainly had that kind of uh, set up. So many different people working on that project. So those paintings on the ceiling, those are actually done on the ceiling. No, so those were done actually in our studio on canvas. The reason we did that was because of the timeline. Father gave us one year to prepare and said, technically said we only had three months to do it, which was the summer months in Arizona. And it, we ended up extending it because we needed more time and he added scope. But they were done on canvas at the studio all ahead of time. And then we brought them to the church in Arizona and applied them to the ceiling using it's almost like a wallpaper paste, like a heavy duty wallpaper. Um, and then they were applied like that. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So Gilbert. Yeah, a question uh, for Maddie. The uh, church obviously um, was uh, recently built. Um, and I'm just kind of curious because I've been in uh, these kind of churches that are kind of replica of older construction methods, but um, they never seem to quite hit that construction method, that earlier elements. And I'm just wondering if your artists were beginning to struggle with anything that they were noticing in this kind of more newer constructed, even though it was replicating the past. Yeah, it, it is interesting because a lot of the times our projects, I would say most of our projects aren't new builds. Typically we work on more of a conservation role in conserving churches or bringing back what historically was there. So Kara had to come up with this whole new design, but that played tribute to the architecture. And I know that the architecture was unique in the sense where it was trying to use style from like an older style, but it's newer. And I think they also had some issues where they had an architect design it, ended up using a different architect. So there were elements of the actual church that didn't make quite sense um, from a design point. And so there were struggles going through it, but the final product is amazing. And the photos do not do justice. If anyone ever has a chance to be in, in the Arizona, um, in like the Scottsdale area, I would highly recommend seeing it. Julie Moran asked, could we please do this more often? That is have a couple of people share and give them more time without pressure. Okay, that's a thought. <laughs> um, yeah, we started, Ken Griesmer started doing this at Southwest Liturgical um, and uh, using the Pecha Kucha format and where you have a set length of time and a set number of slides. And it's a fun way to see a whole lot of work at once. But I also agree that it's, it's nice to take more time on projects. And uh, yeah, so we did have to cut some people off. It, it's, it's a challenge getting it all in there in seven minutes. <laughs> um, some people I could tell practiced this. Um, let's see. Oh, Gilbert, um, the color scheme was just incredible. And it turned that church that was so blah into something really spectacular. That and the raridos in the background, that was 
um, just covering up that little tiny window there was such an inspired way to go. Uh, can you say a little bit more about? Well, um, again, uh, what I find it's it, it, in many respects, it's easy in the Hispanic culture to uh, utilize colors of celebration. They just, there's so many different colors that are there. Um, I would say that pitfall and the one that we initially fell into was not going into stereotyping and realizing that every Mexican, I, I mean, Mexican is only one of the Hispanic cultures that's represented in that parish. And so really trying to find something that would wash over um, the, the different groups uh, was a fairly delicate uh, issue, I would say. Luckily, again, this uh, Jesuit was trained as a graphic designer in Mexico City and himself Mexican, but knew enough of, I think, especially uh, Puerto Rican and Colombian and a few other uh, of the Hispanic groupings that he could find these colors of celebrations that were common with the others. Because when he when he kept saying salmon was a color he wanted to use, I was thinking, that just makes no sense to me. But uh, it was kind of fun to see what he was able to pull together. And then once we showed the committee, they were all bought on that because they just loved the idea of these colors. Mm, yeah, the colors are great. Paul, I'm trying to see if he's there. Um, Paul May, your project where you got rid of something and then put that beautiful light box in there, um, which I guess functions as a gathering space. Yeah, it's the transition from the the sanctuary into the into the um, parish center, which is the gathering space and also serves as the entrance. Yeah. And uh, I assume that that pathway that goes through the garden, that is slightly ramping up as- Yeah, it's the, it's the ADA accessible entrance as well. And the previous cloister um, had steps in it that would go from one side to another. So not only was it very foreboding where the congregation was saying, come on in and the door said this, yeah. um, um, you would, if the doors were open, you would come in and be immediately uh, uh, have steps to go anywhere. Do you know if, uh, what effect this has had on the community? Like, do they have more people coming to the church now? Yeah, and it is a community center as well. And people stop in, they have music um, events there. They have um, uh, families moving forward that, that happen there. And um, other churches in the in the area tend to reference what was happening, what happened there as what they would want to do yeah. on their own. I think in the last webinar that we had, Gilbert was talking about how when you invite people in, that it actually is safer than trying to keep them out. Hmm. Right? Was that you or was that someone else? It wasn't, it wasn't me, but but I'll, okay. I'll take credit for it. Okay. <laughs> it's a great statement. <laughs> I thought you said that. Um, yeah. Do we have any more questions? If not, then I think we should call it a night. Oh, I, I wanted to ask Paul something. Are, are you there, Paul Barbo? I am. Yes. Okay. Um, can you say a little bit more about those windows and whatever it was that you, those fins that you put in there to try to um, diffuse the light? What did you do there? Yeah, so it, uh, essentially we just uh, cut huge amounts of new window into the existing uh, masonry wall. And, um, one of the things that concerned us is that we did not want, as the sun moved from the east to the southeast, we did not want to be blinding people on the platform. So we uh, included those fins as a way of blocking that light until it reached a point in the sky where it could no longer directly hit the chancel space and uh, disrupt uh, presiders looking out into the congregation. Uh, an interesting story about it. Um, 
the contractor that bid the project misbid the project and they almost all disappeared from the project. But uh, it's a great example of a team effort. My construction administrator, that's a member of our firm, uh, managed to help navigate to keep them all in the project without it costing the owner uh, an arm and a leg. And uh, it's a good reminder to those of us that are designers that it's not over until it's constructed. And the other personnel that work on buildings are incredibly gifted with what they do to keep the designs intact. Yeah. Did they have to do any kind of refinishing to the apostle statues when they move them? I, I take it that's on the back wall of the church where they end up? <laughs> It, it was on the, originally it was on the rarest wall and it was moved to a side chapel where people could get closer and see the quality of the carvings. Um, the uh, Gianfranco Tessara that many of you know and inspired artisans, a uh, member of ACLS uh, did the restoration work to bring the color back to the wood. Uh, so that they looked beautiful and we're now um, within a, Proximity to people in the chapel that the scale felt better and people get close enough to actually see the beauty of them. Very nice. Okay, well, I thank you to all our presenters and thank you to everyone that came. And I hope you're all inspired about breathing new life into existing buildings. Good night, everyone.